What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of It Resolves. My name is Kevin. My name is Will. Get off me, Kev. Sorry. Jesus. Guys, uh, we are really excited. We have a very special guest with us, Andrew, our good friend. He's been working with us from the very beginning. Andrew, how are you doing, buddy? Uh, you know, I can't complain. Can't complain. Good, good. We are happy to have you here for a very special topic uh, that we will go over in a minute. But uh, before you, yeah. so you, you have to do your thing. If Thanks you, for watching, tuning is. in, <laughs> listening, doing it, however you're doing it, where you are doing it. Perfect. Guys, as always, <laughs> these, episodes, you're about. <laughs> these episodes are sponsored by our good friends over at Cardsphere.com. Uh, best place, in my opinion, to buy, sell, and trade Magic Cards. I love it. I use it pretty regularly. Andrew, you use it occasionally, right? Uh, yeah, I actually just re up my account so that I can get some more Commander stuff. There you go. Sweet. It is fantastic. I really, really love it. Definitely suggest checking it out. Their link is in the description down below. Yes. Uh, so do. check that out. So show schedule for today, guys. Of course, we're going to kick off with our random card of the day. And then card of the day. I can speak. As, I swear. As, as pro podcasting. Now, pro podcasting. Say the right words. Um, <laughs> we have the best words. We so have use the them. best words. Uh, then the topic that uh, Andrew and we sort of did some some communication on, the thing that we think is going to be exciting is talking about proxying and fake uh, or counterfeit cards. Uh, Andrew has some specific opinions that I'm excited to hear, I will say. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> I don't know what they are. Andrew, I know some of them. You may surprise me. Yeah, I'm excited. So uh, we'll have some back and forth on that. And then, of course, we'll have our question of the week. And then our Cracker Packs, sponsored, of course, by Grand Slam Comics and Collectibles. Right. It's fantastic. Cool. Uh, Andrew, we are going over our random card in three, two, one. Angel Heart Vial. A five cast rare uh, from Eldra Rise of Eldrazi. It's an artifact. Whenever you are dealt damage, you may put that many charge counters on Angel Heart Vial. And then you can pay two and tap it, remove four charge counters from Angel Heart Vial, and you gain two life and draw a card. How is the? How's this one? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not great. No, not great. Commander, maybe. Commander, maybe. Um, very, I, very niche. Very niche. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't really know <laughs> because this obviously would take another artifact slot from a commander deck, right? Because you yes. want. You've got utility artifacts in Commander that are kind of in every deck, yeah. you would say. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't think this is uh, synergistic enough with any Commander that comes <laughs> to my mind, unless it's like an artifact thing. Yeah. But then there are other better artifacts to use. But I, this isn't like, this doesn't fit in any deck specifically. So this is just a tool. But it's, it's not. It's just like extra value, but it's not a good enough value. You don't card. care. Right. You don't care about gaining life. You're, you want to draw a card, but there's yeah. better ways to do it. Yeah, I would say so. You know what I mean? So, I could see... <sighs> it's just so slow. And not to mention, it's also dependent on you taking damage. Right. Which is, like, not... I you mean, know, you never it's not ideal, right? Like <laughs> what I will say is, I, I would want to try it in limited. I don't I feel like it's way too slow in limited. Well, here's the thing. I don't think it would be great in limited. I don't even think it'd be good. But no. what it can do is stop a board stall because it helps you get to your thing. It draws you Yeah, but like again, it's one one use per turn depending right. on if you have enough counters on it first of all. And like that's just so many like it's like jumping through hoops just to draw a card and gain a couple life. And oh, I, I mean, just don't think it's Look, for sure. You know what I mean? I'm saying it it'll keep you it'll keep you in a little longer. I think if you're trying to draft a control deck in limited, I think this can this has a spot. Yeah. But only if, like, it's... There's nothing else. Yeah, there's I no guess. no better pick. And that's... I'm trying to find a place yeah, to Yeah, that's... It. I think it's a stretch, but yeah, I get what you're saying. You know. Andrew, any thoughts on it? All right. I can see that there are three kinds of people in the world. All I'm thinking about right now is double <laughs> doubling season, a proliferation sweep, <laughs> you know, a commitment that just eats 1-1 one, one counters. Sure. But, like, even then, you only get one activation off of this per exactly. turn. Yeah. Like, even if you have a million counters on it, you only ever get one activation per turn. Unless you're right. comboing and you can untap. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get this whole thing called unwinding clock. And yeah, okay. okay. But, like, come on. <laughs> if there's a card that says every time you gain life, untap a permanent, then... That's cool. Then that would be sweet. I don't know if there's a card I don't know that if there that. is one. You're Dear looking it up. Google. Dear okay. Google. Because actually, that would be really good. It would be pretty sweet. But again, then you're relying on 
also mana and counters. Well, there's a million ways to get mana I mean, in that, Commander. It's just like you're relying on so many things, I feel like. But at that point, you get to like draw your whole deck and gain a million life. Sure, if you get there. But like, nah. I'm not I'm not sold on this one. I'm I'm saying that's that's my my uh, what's the word? Uh stipulation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gain weight. <laughs> You're really looking this up. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Untap. I just think, like, you're relying on so many different things. You, you needed, it, like, Yes, but I'm saying in Commander, you're In Commander, fine you can get there. That. Like, But I'm just saying, like, yes, Proliferate's probably going to be the best place for it, or some kind of counter-heavy deck. You can get extra counters on it pretty easily. So that's not terrible. But then you're relying on an untap either every turn or whenever you gain life. Then you're relying on having enough mana to do this in a meaningful number of times. Like, sure. If you get there, it's great because it's if you can go infinite, it's infinite life and infinite card draw. But, like, I just don't think it's I don't think it's worth it, personally. That's all I'm saying. No, and I'm with you. I yeah, just think yeah. that if there could be a way to break it, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, maybe. But, eh. I'm all not right. finding one. Nope. Let's move on. This Let's is move not, on. Let's not so, take them up. All right, so as we said at the top of the show today, uh, Andrew is joining us to talk about uh, some proxying cards, uh, counterfeit cards, things like that yeah. as sort of a general topic and sort of from an ethical standpoint is at least where I'm coming from with sure. this. Like, is it right or wrong to do this kind of thing? Andrew, let's get some opening thoughts from you. What do you think, buddy? Uh, just off the top, I feel like the, <clears throat> the term counterfeit is kind of a dirty word because that, that really signifies intent sure you know if you, if you print off a dual land or a lotus or something like that and you put it in the sleeve and you try and sell it to somebody that doesn't know any better mm -hmm. then you're a trash person <laughs> yeah but, yeah i'll agree <laughs> yeah fair sold if you print off a black lotus and you put it in the sleeve and you put it with a bundle of other cards so you could play legacy on your kitchen table mm -hmm. i honestly don't see anything wrong with that because nobody's going to pay eighty thousand dollars which is what the most recent lotus is sold for eighty-seven thousand. Yeah. yeah it was up there and uh you know i i just feel i feel like that there's uh you know a dozen and a half better things that you could be doing as far as <laughs> not counterfeiting yes yeah. yeah i mean i uh, on the on the face of it, I say I would say I agree with you in the terms of like because I've proxied stuff for a power cube before, mm -hmm. for instance. But I was never there was no intent to sell. It wasn't as you would say the sort of counterfeit side of things. It wasn't sure. like I was actually trying to sell those cards off, which I agree. I think is one hundred percent wrong. There is no real good reason to do that. Yeah. Um, and so I agree with you on that front. I will say, and something Will and I talked about at one point is that. I feel like the cards, if you're going to proxy the cards, you have to be able to very clearly tell right off the bat, out of a sleeve or something like that, that it is clearly a fake card. Yeah, like make a different card back or something. Put yeah. a black line through the back of it or or just write fake across the back somehow. That way there's never any chance that it gets sold as a right. counter. You know what I mean? Like, Does that make sense to you, Andrew? Oh, absolutely. And usually when I personally make them, they're just stickers that go on basic lands. Sure. So you can, you know, look at it and see, oh, there's a scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think okay. that makes sense. And again, I like the what you're calling out is that it is nice to have them for certain situations. If you're trying to cube, if you're trying to do test a deck or something like that, I think it's perfectly fine to proxy a deck out give it a shot or proxy a cube out and be able to sit mm -hmm. down and play with some cards that you wouldn't normally be able to play with with just some friends. Um, it's just with that intent, if there is any intent or any potential intent for that card to be sold as an actual card, I think mm -hmm. that's what needs to be avoided at all costs. Yeah, I am I am really most of the time against it. Yeah. Um, the quote-unquote proxies that I've made before are sharpied cards <laughs> like I will take a forest flip it over because I got a million basic lands yeah, and write out the card I want to proxy yeah. because when I proxy cards I'm only <clears throat> doing it to test a deck if I'm brewing something for standard I'm going to throw cards I don't have in there because I don't yeah. you know I don't have every card that I want to play with sure um, so I'll just see what works what doesn't I think if you're I I only support proxying really in two instances one just for casual fun with yeah. your buddies like 
if, if you got a box of fake cards, like for a power cube, yeah. like you were saying, okay, that's fine. Or if you're going to test a deck before you take it to an FNM or something like that. And even then, I am hesitant <clears throat> for there to be a, a market or a circulation of fake cards. Yeah. Um, I think it's beyond valuable to be able to pick apart a deck before you spend actual money to go and put it together. Yeah. Because this is a this is a game that can cost people hundreds, thousands of dollars if they want to get competitive. I get that. That's fine. But I don't want there to even be an innocent mistake. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. With a, with a fake card or something. Even if it's a standard card. Like if it's a... If you don't have all the cards, but you want to see how a deck with four cards might run in it. Yeah. For instance. Even though you should probably only run two or three. Uh, <laughs> and you want to proxy some cards. Okay, that's... All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get that. Sense. And I think, you know, you're taking it in the deck testing sort of uh, side of things. The way I... The reason I would proxy a card is because... And, I've again, we've done this before. Uh, proxying stuff for a cube or something mm-hmm. like that so that we can either stream or mm-hmm. have some video content to put up that's sure. related to that. And even just to sit down and have some fun with friends. Yeah. But I think now, having a channel, the, the goal would be to make that look better. And so for... For my instance, I don't like the idea of writing on the back of a card for a Black Lotus, but I'm sure. down with like actually getting a proxy. But then, like you were mentioning, on the flip side, on the back side, because it's going to be sleeved, have some sort of significant notifier like, hey, this is clearly fake. Yeah, yeah just make um, it tell. But that way, you still get a good-looking Black Lotus on camera, right? Like, it still looks like the card on the front side of it. Sure, yeah. And I- that's what's important. I mean, from the video content perspective, that's kind of what I think about. Yeah, I mean, I can... I can drive to that. I think it still makes me feel weird, but <laughs> does I'm, it really? It does, but I'm, I think I'm Andrew, okay. With how that. do you feel about that, Andrew? Well, I don't know if you guys remember or not, like how long you've been playing, but they used to put out what they call collector set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mhm. I mean the gold bordered cards and then the squared. Sorry, you were cutting out a little bit there, buddy. Sorry, I'm on push to talk so you don't get all the residual <laughs> No worries. What did you say? But basically with the gold borders and the black backs, mm-hmm. just like unglued cards, you could tell mm-hmm. at a glance these were not authentic, but they functioned the same. They had that gold signature across of them. I personally loved them because you could get them, sleeve them, and play them against your buddies without having to spend $500 on a legacy back. Yeah, no, I agree. Sure. I, I appreciate those especially. And I, again, I think... I, when we were originally originally cubing this was even before the channel um we pulled out some of the the tournament deck cards Mm -hmm. the gold bordered cards and we actually used those because again you if you don't want to spend 100 bucks on some kind of really rare card or something like that just find a a cheaper version or find a i mean it just it worked really well so i i support the fact that you can use those for sure for like just in your friend group yeah yeah yeah. here's a question i'll pose to really the both of you but andrew first so uh, let's say you sit down at a, I don't know, to play a game of Commander, mm. and maybe there there it's not been addressed before, um, fake cards, proxy cards, whatever you want to call them, um, and someone's up front and says, hey, like I've got ten proxies in this deck because I haven't finished it or I haven't bought it yeah. all yet. What are your, what are your thoughts? Or if even if someone doesn't say it and you just, you know, they're playing with fake cards, even if it's something like Commander. To um, clarify, is this just for friend group kind of thing, or is this... I think in both situations. Like, what if you go to play... And it's not for a tournament ever, but okay, like a casual like meet-up at Grand Slam. Say we'll do a commander night. and Andrew, what do you think? That's, that's kind of a dynamic question, because it does kind of matter in that regard. First off, if you're playing in a league or a, a tournament or even just casually at a shop, I feel like it needs to be shop rules. I see. That's fair. I mean, I think that makes sense because you don't want there to... You don't want, especially on the business end of things, you don't want your business associated with having, like, you know, counterfeit cards or anything like that related to it, even if it is on a small basis, because then people recognize, okay, your store has counterfeit cards, people playing counterfeit cards, what if they've sold some cards to the shop Mm -hmm. or something like that? Like, there's questions that get raised there that Mm -hmm. I think would be really unhealthy for a store, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um Absolutely, but on a casual level, um, let's just say, for instance, right now, Gaius Cradles, what, $300, $350? Something around there, yeah. yeah. Okay, so 
if you're playing something like Azusa mm -hmm. or um, Azuri or any anything mono green. Yeah. If you're playing it. Cutting out again, buddy. What? <laughs> if you want to play anything mono green, you want to play a guy's cradle. That's just sure. kind of standard. Yeah, of course. Well, even the gold bordered guy's cradle now sometimes goes for upwards of thirty or forty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So the temptation to say, hey, And then leave them waiting. It's great. I understand. <laughs> you keep cutting out a little bit, Andrew. Uh, to the the temptation to just say, "Hey, I can buy one for three dollars yeah. in China and put it in my deck, and nobody's really going to question me on it." While a double sleeve mm -hmm. creates the problem that creates a counterfeit market. Right. Now, Wizards of the Coast, I think, is obviously prime to say okay well since this is becoming a problem players obviously want these why don't we bring back the uh, the collector's edition why don't we bring back the championship decks why yeah. don't we bring back some of these things to give these options for cards that you just can't get anywhere well um, here's here's the masters could be a thing where you get a three dollar pack of a hundred dollar proxies my my whole weird position with that is if Wizards officially puts out proxy product, which if Wizards were to make it, we could just say it wouldn't be tournament legal, and that's really the only stipulation. Yeah. Like it, it would look different. Gold border, what, what have you. It wouldn't be tournament legal, right? Why not just Gold reprint the cards? Was the, uh, because... Was the norm for the collector's editions, sure. and black backs, gold borders was the uh, championship decks. Right. Well, sure, but you couldn't play those at like a um, GP, right, or an open. No. Right. So it, they would make those only to be big cards, right, to be played casually or something. Like collectors don't want those. Correct me if I'm wrong, but would you want no? A fake I mean, Black I would Lotus? not. No, absolutely not. Like, I because there's no yeah. value in the card. Collectors want value and novelty, and to say I have a card that is almost black lotus is <laughs> like it just doesn't feel as good so like it appeals to a certain market so i understand the like like to the people who don't want to spend money but do want to play with these you know valuable cards or these cards that are powerful that mm -hmm. they can't normally play with like i understand there is a need for that i don't know though if printing as you were saying andrew sort of a master set for that kind of a thing i don't know that that's the answer and I, I'm not saying I know what a better answer would be, but the reason I don't like that is it sets up a weird dynamic where, like, hey, it's cool, you don't have to spend money on our game because we'll print a thing for you that says you don't have to, basically. And it's like, it just... Well, it does, but it doesn't, because, again, you can only play with those, like, basically yeah, well, in your home. Yeah, I mean... Right? Which is great. It was, it, that makes for a fun, interesting night of Magic, which I'm sure. all about, but... I don't know. I don't know. It just feels like a little bit off the cuff to me yeah. for like a Wizards product. And again, sure. I get that in the past they've done the championship decks and things like that, but I felt like that was more of a promotion of the championship deck itself, not mm -hmm. just to like get cards out there. Because that was just something that they did for every championship. Um, or at that time, they would print the winning deck out as right. the gold border thing. So it wasn't ever... The intent wasn't just to be like, hey... Here's some really powerful cards for you guys to play with. It was like, here's let's let's celebrate that this deck won. Let's make this a little bit more special. Here are some gold border cards. You know, that kind of thing. So I don't know. I, I don't know that that's the way I would mm -hmm. go about it. But again, that being said, I don't know if there's a better way to do it. Well, I mean, the easy answer is to not. But. Yeah, I mean, the easy answer is to not, I guess. But what do you, Andrew, what are you thinking? I, I can't think that the easy answer would be to not. Because right now, I think we can all agree that with the complexities and the quality of the Chinese proxies that we're getting, they're far too good, and they're only getting better. That is a problem. I know that's something you wanted to touch on, uh, because they are getting better and better, actually. Well, 
I mean, I have some that are, are blue core that you can feel the coating difference on, and they don't pass the bend test. However, the light test goes through the same way as uh, Battle Bond cards because the printing error on those. Right, right. Well, and that's something to think about, too, is that printing has, obviously, they announced that they were changing up their print methods and things mm -hmm. like that, and they're kind of going through some changes there. And so it's making new age counterfeit cards, I guess, a little bit harder to actually pull, or a little bit easier for them to actually pull off the fake cards because we don't really know what's going on with the print stuff right now. Oh, you know right. what I mean? Like, right. Each set seems like it's different. It's a little okay. bit different each time, at least in the past couple sets it has been. Um, which sets up a weird dynamic for fake cards sure, and sort sure. of a unique market. So correct me if I'm wrong then, Andrew. You're saying that we should, Wizards should make these alternate cards, we'll say, to kind of stop the draw or the want of better proxies from somewhere else because those are getting like dangerous to play? Absolutely. Like, there's no reason that we can't have a gold bordered set with alternate art, like the MTG Online cards mm -hmm. that have never been printed in paper, like Vintage Masters on MTGO. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's no reason that they can't get in front of the proxy market, give the customer what they want at a competitive price point for what they're already getting. Because let me tell you, it's not cheap to get cards from China. Yeah. 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 Well, so then my question becomes, why are folks buying them? If the proxies are really good, almost realistic, if they're expensive to get, people are spending money, in my mind, to play them competitively. and Or to resell. Know, or to resell. Well, but the thing is, yes, they're expensive, but they're not, they're not at the price point that the real cards are at. And so you still, if you were, hopefully not, but if your intention was to turn a profit on those, you'd be able to still. You know oh, no, I mean? no, I get that. I get that. But I'm saying for someone to play a fake card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's still, it's cheaper. Like you were saying with a power cube. If you wanted to build an authentic power cube, you're out a million bucks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you wanted to play an authentic power cube with proxy cards, you're out 300 bucks. If that. I mean, you can, yeah, you you can, can make a much cheaper... But even then. still, it's like, I mean, the percentage is so much lower, you know what I mean? Well, like, I totally It's insane. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean... And you get the same video quality that you guys were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. you, get the same, you get the same feel when you play them. Like, when I do uh, the, the pack battles game that Kevin's familiar with that I created, mm -hmm. I've got Power 9 in that. I've got um, Authentic... Uh, Guild Gates, Maze End, and then you shuffle a pack into it and play it. It feels really good to put out three Moxes, a Lotus, and a Land Turn 1 and be able to play anything you pulled in a pack. Well, sure. It wouldn't feel as good as if it was a Flip Around Forest with Sharpie on the back. It wouldn't feel as good as if it was a stickered card, but to actually feel the <laughs> card in your hand, to know that when you pull a card, you're not automatically going to know what it is by the thickness of it because it's got a decal on it. Uh huh. It gives you that that authentic feeling, and if you're not a, a financial collector, if you're just someone who enjoys playing the game, mm -hmm. I feel like that's a market that's severely undervalued, and that's a, a huge portion of profits for people that have moved away from the game, the newer mechanics, and they, you know, they just want to sit down and replay Magic like it was in the 1990s, early 2000s. Hmm. I mean, I will attest to, again, having done the Power Cube thing at one point, I will attest to the fact that it does feel better to have a realistic-looking card in sure. front of you no matter what sure. instead of the sharpie on the back kind of thing though again that's because i'm trying to think of things in terms of like video content like if i was just sitting right. down with friends i don't think i would do that you know what i mean like well, i would be I'm okay with just flipping a card and doing that whole thing but i i don't know i i like the fact that i could go and like get some proxies for some casual game it's just my worry for the whole thing, my worry for this whole like fake cards topic is that people are trying to turn profits on them. That's where my worry comes in. Well, right. I think if the proxy is too good yeah. in any respect, let's say it's not a sticker, or even if it is a sticker, and you've got a sleeved up whatever, whatever card you might want to proxy. Like I was telling Kevin, if you go to sell out in 10 years, mm -hmm. maybe you forgot you proxied that card once. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're not able to tell. Yeah. And even, like, in the best scenario, that's an innocent mistake, and you just sold a kid, I don't know, an $80 fluster storm, <laughs> when really it's a 25-cent mountain or something. <laughs> Which is, again, fine for your kitchen table. Yeah, And I yeah. get that no honest Magic player is going to forget that they didn't have a fluster I storm. I mean, yeah, yeah. But that's the best case scenario really for that stuff yeah i mean i think you're right so if you can easily tell a proxy is fake and that's your intent when you design a proxy design a fake card Mm -hmm. okay i'm kind of okay with that um i don't like playing strangers who play fake cards like if if i take a deck out in public i need it finished and that's even for commander stuff like i'm not going to take a proxy deck to a card shop yeah. And say, hey, no, can I, I test this either. deck with you, person that I if I know the know person, like that's a little bit of a different story. But if I was in a store setting, especially with people I don't know, I would sure. not hundred yeah. percent. I don't think there's any way I could yeah. do that. I think if you're if you're open about needing to test a deck, I yeah, I expect most of it to be proxy. I'm gonna yeah. be honest because yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't want you to have put together a deck that's mostly real cards and yeah. not work. Um, so if if I have friends who want to test decks, I'm expecting a lot of it to be proxied or whatever sure back when i played um really grinded played a little more heavily my buddies and i would proxy a bunch of stuff to see what what would happen mm-hmm. um but we even for commander nights we never played with decks that weren't finished yeah um just as kind of an unspoken rule uh i don't i don't know that that's it would i don't know if it looks bad for anyone to play with a proxy deck i'm not sure just because we never did we never thought about that possibility yeah, yeah. it didn't feel like a deck unless it was real I mean, I again, if it's testing a deck, like Andrew, for instance, your uh, modern deck that you were testing out a little bit, the Sahili combo kind of thing, and the liquid metal coating, which was a sweet deck, by the way. But um, <laughs> that that deck, um, some of it was obviously proxy, but you were in the deck testing phase of it, and then you just put whatever. And so when we would sit down to play, it was here at my apartment, and like mm-hmm. there wasn't anybody else. It wasn't a public setting. It was literally just you and I sitting down to test that deck. That was fine. I'm totally down well, yeah, for that. Yeah. But actually. like again, I I think you're right. If I was going to a store and somebody said like, "Hey, uh, do you guys want to sit down have a multiplayer game, do something like that?" I don't have all my cards though. I've only got like ten of them. Right. Like if that if that just flew off the cuff like that, and it wasn't like pre said that hey, this is testing and stuff. Like that's a red flag for me. Yeah. I don't. I wouldn't feel. And I, I don't know if that's me. Comfortable. I don't know if that sounds unfair, but I wouldn't. I don't think I'd play with someone who's not playing with a finished deck. Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of where I'm at too. Andrew, thoughts on that? I, uh, well, I've been on both sides of that. Yeah. Um, at the shop, there's a, a league up there, and another guy and I who recently met at league uh, both have some proxies in our modern builds, and we're both testing and most talked about it but sat down and played yeah and you know there was no issue but you knew that before yeah that's right? the thing you had the the pre right. conversation well, yeah to that. okay right. so i think that's fine and you know I don't, again i don't know if you guys remember but well probably five or ten years ago there were sanctioned modern turn or uh, proxy tournaments and i wouldn't play in a proxy tournament i don't think that's kind of just me I don't, uh, and you know, a lot of people wouldn't, but it was a, it was a, a level of entry, I think, for people that wanted sure. to play vintage. Uh, okay, I, I mean, mean, yeah, that's and there's, fair. and that's a good point. So, okay, I could get behind like some kind of vintage mm-hmm. game that was proxied. Because well, yeah, I mean, it's vintage. I mean, yeah, as long as there's no winnings on the line, it's yeah. not sanctioned in any way. If, if like. If it's literally a for fun tournament with some yeah, friends, like, like that kind come of thing. play with Magic's strongest cards, but no one wins anything. Like yeah. I would still go to that just to be able to build Actually, like. Not to, not to interrupt, but I think there it was sanctioned and there were prizes on the line. Yeah, see, I don't no, I'm see. Cool yeah, I'm not. I'm not in necessarily support of that either. I think that feels a little weird. Yeah, I. No. I mean, I get, so obviously this is something that comes up in Magic all the time. A lot of people I know have stopped playing because of this, that it's like a pay-to-play game. And, like, that's a barrier for quite a lot of people, understandably. And so, in my mind, 
like, yes, it is kind of a pay to play game because if you're gonna do the tournament grinding and you're gonna put in that effort, then you have to pay. You have to have the real cards in my mind. I right. feel like that's that's a whole other level of playing though. If you just wanna yeah. sit down with friends, that's one thing. Again, I'm not against proxying and mm -hmm. testing and all that in that casual environment, but any sort of sanctioned tournament, anything, I'm a little bit more cautious. Like I don't think I'd wanna do that. I don't I wouldn't want to do a proxied kind of tournament. Yeah, Unless I, either. I will say this, and obviously this is something that is talked about already. It's already a thing. If you are playing vintage and you don't want to beat up your Black Lotus, as long as you can prove that you have a real Black Lotus, you can play a proxy in a tournament. That's but that's a different story. You actually still have the card. You know what I mean? Is that an actual? I like, believe that's an actual rule? tournament rule, but I might be uh, incorrect. It was the last time that I followed vintage. So yeah, I don't think that's changed. Like five or ten years. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of always been a thing. Because, I mean, realistically, if you're playing with a Black Lotus, you don't want to play it in your deck and then right. beat up the Black Lotus. You know what Could I mean? Could you imagine Ryan Kibler with a Black Lotus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awful. I'll Let me just watch. waste $5 every time I do this. <laughs> no, um, but I mean, as long as you can prove Jeez. that you have the legitimate one, that's different because again it's a value yeah. thing at that point it's like you just don't want to mess up the card yeah and these cards have gotten so absurdly expensive yeah, i can yeah. understand having a rule like that you don't have to play with your eighty thousand. you don't have to put <laughs> your child's college fund on the line yeah. <laughs> yeah to play in this tournament i can understand that but that if you're sense. gonna if you're gonna go to a local tournament like a charlotte open you like do if, need to have the card yeah if star city games is having a modern open yeah you if someone had would take proxies to that, I would be surprised if they didn't get thrown out on the that. Ride. Yeah, I mean, I would hope that they right. would, to be honest. Right. Like I, I get investing money. Like you don't want to put that yeah. on the line to play, but I don't know. I don't know. I, proxies are always kind of a gray area for me yeah. in some respects. Excuse me, but um, I don't know. I I don't like them at tournaments. End of story. Yeah. Like that's just kind way. of the way I I'm am. The same way. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong necessarily, oh. but I think I'm right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair. Fair. Um, everybody. Do what? Yeah. So does everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's where all the problems in the world come from. Um, all right. Well, I, Andrew, anything, uh, final kind of topics, anything else that you wanted to bring up that we haven't already touched on? Well, the, I, I had two final points that I, I wanted to, uh, touch on real quick. Go for it. Um, a few years ago, they were planning on doing a documentary on tabletop games featuring Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to game. One of the quotes that is heavily premiered on that particular project, I guess you would call it, was uh, Mark Rosewater talking about the value or Richard Garfield, my bad. Richard mm -hmm. Garfield talking about the value and rising cost of single magic cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as the creator of the game, I feel like his opinion carries a lot of weight. And he was talking about how when he envisioned the game and saw it <laughs> from Alpha, Beta, Unlimited, Revised, 4th Edition, all of these sets, he saw the value creep up and creep up and you know, when cards started hitting forty and fifty dollars, he he legitimately kind of had a problem with that on the secondary market and wanted to continue printing. Yeah. Now, when that didn't happen, that's because of corporate issues or whatever. We got in a situation now where there are cards out there that cost more than some of our houses. Right. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of outside of the point of having a game that's marketed to 13 plus because you get a savant out there who can who can come out and play vintage or legacy after they sit down at their first release and they get the game and it just clicks with them they're like okay so this two land belcher thing i saw on youtube i want to go do that there's no way if that person's on any kind of normal means income that they'll be able to do that in the next 15 20 years you mean play vintage, play legacy, that? Right. Like, that's a, that's a serious investment that, you know, you can't expect someone under the age of 30, really, to reasonably fulfill. Sure. 
And because of that, I think that's why we're in the situation that we're in. And this discussion that we've just had over the last half hour has really brought to the point that this is not a black and white issue. This is not a situation that's, first off, it's not going to wait. Secondly, I mean, it's, it's something that needs to be talked about and there needs to be some kind of, of general consensus in the community, I think, on the idea of proxies. And honestly, I do think that the best thing for Wizards of the Coast to do would be to get in front of it and, you know, push the competition out. Make it so that there is no demand for a third party. Make it a, a print-on-demand thing where somebody says, okay, I need two cases of so-and-so. And when they run out of those pallets or get down to the last one, they run another two pallets off to have them ready to ship out. Well, here's my one, my pushback on that final point is that if the goal would be to make cards for people to play vintage at a tournament, then they will never get ahead of the competition because they will never print a card that will be able to be played at a tournament unless that person already has that card. They're never going to be, they're never going to print a tournament legal Black Lotus again. Like. No, absolutely not. Right. So there's going to be a market for fake cards that are tournament quote unquote quality. You know what I mean? I agree with that, but at the same time, I think that there are enough safety measures in place because, again, until we get to the point where they can pass the light test, the vent test, and all of this stuff, I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where we're going to have people infiltrating vintage and fake cards on a regular basis. Well, okay, so then, so then there's not a problem with fake cards in that case because that's the only issue is that they're playing illegal cards at tournaments. Or they're selling again, but you're, it's the same test. Selling is the okay. reason I find the issue with selling more so than the tournament because obviously at a tournament, any tournament worth its weight or that is sanctioned or something like that is they're going to be checking for things like that sure. more regularly. Sure, sure. And ideally, if you're selling, of course you should be, but not all just one-on-one -on -one buyers are going to be like, okay, I need to look for this, this, and this. You know what I mean? They're just like, oh, this card is really good. I want it. And so like. Right. That's where I think there's much more of a dangerous presence of fake cards because you can easily card shark somebody and just be like, hey, I've got this really good card. I'll sell it to you for 50 bucks. It costs them a 10 cents to print it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's it's just that well, then, that's the mentality that I get. Well, then again, I, again then I still don't see a way Wizards gets in front of that. because I don't know that they do either. Because they don't print a card that even resembles. Yeah. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Tournament legal, whatever kind of card this is, even sure. if it's not tournament, even if it's like a fifty dollar card, they're yeah. not going to print one that's so similar if it's quote unquote not playable. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So my argument would be, if there's a if there's a demand for these cards on the market, mm -hmm. reprint those cards, make a set like the master set that's dedicated to. I'll reprints. tell you, and this is this is a problem that a fundamental problem with Magic as mm -hmm. a game and as a collector's item is that now they're appealing to not just the gaming market. They're appealing to the collector's market. Sure. And those are two very different avenues to take one singular thing. Yeah. And so what the issue is, and what they've already done in Chronicles back in the day, was that they decided, well, people want to play with these cards, they want to make it more accessible, so we'll reprint them. That pissed everybody off who was collecting at that time because... Sure. You see what I'm saying? And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying they're trying to appeal to two different groups of people at the same time. And it's like, yes, that's yes. a fundamental problem with Wizards that they do not have an answer for. The answer is appeal to the player. I think it should be. It's at for first and foremost a game. Yes. And so yes. you should appeal yes. to the players before you appeal to the collectors. 100%. But I'm saying that as a collector, and that's kind of difficult too. You I know understand. what I mean? Because like, I'm much more of a collector than a player. And I so. And I, I get that there are people who have put hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. into And they just magic. don't want their to their investment to go downhill. I understand That's that. the problem. I don't think you need to get rid of the, uh, the what do they call it, the restricted list? The, uh, the Thank you, reserved yes, list. Yes, thank you. I don't think you need to take cards off of the reserved list, but you want people to play your game, you want your game to survive another 10 years? Then You need to keep it as a game. Yes, it needs yep. to be accessible. Now... Again, you don't need to destroy someone's yeah uh, collection value. And I'll say this too: 
not reprinting a card doesn't always affect a card's value. Depending on how they reprint. You have there's so many factors. Ab the about biggest a thing that value. we've talked about before is changing the artwork as being like right. You know what I mean? Like yeah, Blood Moon has new artwork. The it. dark version is still like so uh, the original Snapcaster Mage is still far more expensive than the Master Snapcaster yeah. Mage, and his value held even when that card was reprinted. Uh, pretty close. Correct me if I'm mistaken. It dropped a bit, but not. What's a bit? Like 10, 15 bucks maybe. But again, then you get people who are like money gouging they're like well that's a so-and-so percent decrease and then they get all pissy about yes, it yes that's but a so -and -so it's like percent. but take liliana of the veil it got yeah. reprinted with its same artwork <laughs> yeah and it's more expensive now than when it was before <laughs> so like i mean that's it all depends on the demand for the car as yeah. any economics teacher will tell you it all depends on demand yeah of course of and course. of course upping the supply will decrease the value unless the demand stays the same yeah that's the thing I don't know. Yeah. It's just an interesting issue, I think, between collecting and actually gaming. Yeah. But anyway, that's a whole other topic for a whole other episode. Andrew, did you have anything else you wanted to bring up? You said you had two points. Well, as Nick was saying, the, uh, the, the cost versus the, um, the availability was the first point. And the mm -hmm. second point, the, um, just the, the fact that it's like you said, you're trying to appeal to the collector and the collector. And I feel by trying to appeal to the collector there, sideways acknowledging the secondary market. Yeah. Now, the company that they can't acknowledge the secondary market, that, that kind of goes, you know, hand in hand. You have to take your side and stick with it. Yes. Say that one more time. Your, your audio is clipping a bit, so if you don't mind just saying that once more. If you're a collector, or if you're, if you're pandering to collectors in any way, shape, or form, that you are obviously acknowledging a secondary market. Okay. As a company, you say you cannot acknowledge the secondary market, but the reserve list is a living example of how you are legitimately making decisions based on a secondary market. Yes. I don't think... I don't think it is. I think it is. Why I, do you not? Well... Because okay, they're saying what you're what you're saying they are saying is that the reason the reserve list exists is to hold the cards value against fakes. Explain Just to hold the cards values for the collectors. Right. I don't it's think the assessment, yes. Yeah, I don't think that acknowledges us you're talking the about collectors being basically the secondary market. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah. oh. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I thought you meant the the people who make proxies are the secondary market. No, no, no. We're okay. just talking real collectors cards at this players. point. Yeah, collectors versus okay. players. Okay. okay. No, Andrew, yeah, that makes I'm sense. Back. Yeah. So by you know, by doing something like printing proxies with silver borders or things like that, I mean what let me ask you this. What would be the harm in printing a standard set in packs and then putting out a box of silver bordered standard cards that on the front has proxy and on the back has magic the proxying or something like that so that you could play test your deck before you invested the $40 you needed in that play set of rares? Because why print both things if one of them is supposed to be more expensive? because both will sell. Once you buy the proxy kit to build your deck, then you either buy packs or buy singles, which means that people have to break cases to sell singles, or you have to buy packs to get cards. I think there's an inherent problem with that, though, and I think the biggest thing that people would run into is that people would assume this is just another way to money gouge players, because Absolutely. it's like, hey, here's this cheaper version of the set. You can't play it at a tournament, but you can use it to test your decks, and it only costs this much. But then if you want to actually play in a tournament or any sanctioned event, you're going to have to spend extra money to just get the same cards that are technically quote-unquote legal. Right. Like, I think that that brings up... I think that's just, like, on a marketing end, not yeah. the best way to do it. Now you're just spending, like, 30% more for one card because yeah. you have to... If you want to test it, in theory, you have to, like, buy the proxy to test it. I think what you would run into would you split the market a little bit, so you'd end up with people who are... One, just not going to care about that the proxy product at all because what's the point if they're going to actually play the deck? Exactly. So they're just going to buy the original stuff anyway, which means Wizards wasted the money to print the proxies. Or you're going to get people who are going to go only proxies and then they're going to lose money that way because they're not selling the actual valued cards. 
and so it's like I think on a flip side it's just not the best way to do it um, but again I get the fact that you should be able to test decks but I think as if you're just testing a deck then you know flip them over do that whole thing can, but like can, yeah I, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily agree with doing that, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I, I don't ever see a company... Well, we'll say, say standard specifically. I don't think you should ever make a fake standard card if you're Wizards. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense, in my opinion. They're going to have even little, even less value after rotation. They're going to be next to worthless. Oh, yeah, no. Um, that was really just an example. But sure. I mean, that's, that's the whole mindset. Like, if you're... There's no right way to do it, like you've said a couple of times over. There's no correct answer. I think that that honestly, at this point, the the market needs to be tested. Like they need to see if that's a thing that they should do. Maybe it's a uh, order directly from Wizards product that they print a limited run of and sell directly to the market from their website. Well, that's again, that's also something that Wizards doesn't like really support. Wizards likes to see its community grow. It franchise franchise i don't know what the word is but uh, it's got local game stores that are mm. certified by wizards like it, it is a very kind of a three-step market in that sense where wizards makes the product the local game stores sell the product and the players play the game yeah you know like i very rarely do you have a wizards to the players product you know what i mean yeah they yeah. don't rely on distribution that way you know that's fair. That's changing their entire business model. I mean, my my biggest thing is we just need to... I think the big takeaway for me is as a player base and as somebody who, if you are looking into proxies, regardless of what for, you need to keep in mind that they need to be obvious that they're proxies or that they're True. fake. Because if you're buying them just to play with friends, you're buying them just to test a deck, that is totally reasonable. I'm not against that in any way. Right. Agreed. But... The things that I want to I want to see a, get out of the market are the people who are buying proxies and buying fakes so that they can resell and buying so that they can infiltrate some sort of tournament and be able to play at that without having to pay the money. Mm. That's that is to me the two biggest issues and the ones that I think you're right. I don't think that there's necessarily a right or wrong way for wizards to deal with it but there is right. clearly a right way for the players to police themselves when it comes to actually getting these cards you know what i mean sure. like just be smart about it is all i'm saying like it's fine to proxy stuff but not if you're trying to resell not if you're trying to right. legal like enter a tournament and right. so that's just where i'm at like i think it's kind of up to the individual at this point to kind of police themselves and wizards obviously does their part of like you know, they've got the blue core. They've got all the tests that we can go through to try and make sure that we're not getting, you know, cheated on these cards and things like that. And that's good. I just think they need to keep that up and maybe even keep changing that to make sure that we know these are fakes. That way the market can't catch up. The proxy market can't catch up. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, that's just one way to handle it. Just to, But I think it's really up to the players at that point mm -hmm. to do it, to just know what they're getting themselves into a little bit more. Yeah. Um. I don't know. That's that would that's kind of my takeaway from it, but I don't know if that's necessarily hundred percent correct. Yeah. No, but definitely like there there definitely needs to be an elimination of people deciding that they're going to, you know, have nefarious purposes with these things because again, for power cubes, for you know, kitchen table magic, for the offhand, you know, side game, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with having something that looks like an authentic card. But again, like I do think there's something wrong with putting it in the binder, not taking it into a shop, and yeah. trying to pass it off as a real thing. Absolutely, sure. sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm behind that. All right. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap up the the proxy and the fake card conversation. Andrew, I just want to give you a quick thank you uh, for joining us with this one. Obviously, it's something that you're pretty passionate about and mm -hmm. something that we're happy to have you on. I also congratulations for being the first guest on our podcast. Yeah, <laughs> broken ground. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. I mean, uh, it's been uh, it's been a good experience, and uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully, I'll talk to you guys 
again at one point or another once you get through the rest of the list of people that are waiting. The you know we will. Of people. The thousands <laughs> of people. Um, well, absolutely. You are welcome back, my friend. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I just do want to give a quick shout out to Andrew a little bit more because he has done a lot for It Resolves. Mm-hmm. He's done a lot of the print material. Any print material He's that you've seen material. has been, it's been through Andrew. He's mm-hmm. done a fantastic job. So Andrew, thank you so much, man. We really do appreciate it. And obviously we'll have you back on at some point, I am sure. Uh, for sure. There's no doubt about that. But um, we're going to head out with, uh, or we're going to finish up the episode. But uh, thank you again, Andrew, and we will talk to you again soon. Hey, thank you guys again for having me, and uh, appreciate it. And uh, hope you guys have a good rest of the day. All right, buddy. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a good one. All right, so. It's weird now that we're still recording. Okay, so question of the week. Uh, <laughs> What's weird now? What's weird now? Yeah. Uh, question uh, of the week last week. What was the most pushed card in Magic? Do you want to uh, give the rundown of what a pushed card is? Absolutely. So a pushed card is essentially a card that is as good as it could ever be without breaking the format. My example I gave last time was Huntmaster of the Fells, where it does so much stuff for four mana uh, that it just seems way too strong for what it is. Yes. Um, Wizards will push these cards to try and make them just super awesome. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So we've actually got a lot to go through here. We'll good. we'll see what we can good. get through. Uh, True Name Nemesis is our first one. Yeah. That's I, up there. <laughs> I could throw, I'd throw my name in, in that basket, sure. Uh, Invisible Stalker, which definitely broke. Uh, there was a deck that it was like insanely good in. Yeah, uh, I played a lot of Invisible Stalker. So um, that card's really cool. It is so hard to remove. Yes, as it turns out. <laughs> Unless you have Edict Effects, yeah, which you true. did in that season, but you didn't want to play it because all of you net decked. All right, what? Wow, call him out. Uh, Fatal Push. Uh, yeah. Do I, I think Fatal Push is pushed? No. Well, it's pushed. No, I think it's an insanely good card. It is I don't insanely think it's pushed because it's got really strong stipulation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's easy to play around, but I don't think it's super pushed. Yeah. I think it's great removal though. Uh, Noble Hierarch. Noble Hierarch's really good. <laughs> uh, good. Somebody said Island? Question mark. If not, then uh, Thoughtseize. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Thoughtseize is really good. I don't, I mean, it, it's for the hand destruction spells, it's like pretty pushed. Oh, it's the best. Yeah, I easily. mean, there's there's no doubt about that. Atraxa. Yeah, might have just broken the format. Um, yep. Mox Opal. Mm. Has someone commented Mox Opal on every single one? Probably. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ugin. Ugin's really dragon? good. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. I would get behind Ugin. Mm-hmm. Uh, literally any elf. You must have just had a bad experience against elves, yeah, man. Sorry about it. Uh, Baneslayer Angel was very sweet. I will say Baneslayer, Baneslayer Angel was there. cool, but Baneslayer was really only so strong because of the uh, meta it was in. Sure, Baneslayer but again, really I think strong. that goes to being pushed for that meta. Ooh, definitely. Touche, touche. Um, tireless Tracker. I, don't, I mean, Tyler Shacker is great. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, you I don't get a know lot of utility, but I don't know. I don't know that I would consider it as pushed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, again, Atraxa and Thoughtseize. Tutors are always good, somebody said. Uh, Soul Ring. I mean. <laughs> One mana to net, two mana. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, okay. The obvious answer, Jace the Mind Sculptor. Yeah, the first four ability Planeswalker. Yeah, that was yeah. a pretty to good To put one. Brainstorm on a Planeswalker was pretty, like... Yeah. I think at the time absurd, too, right? I think so, too. Yeah, yeah. And for, like, it wasn't a negative cost. It was just a zero ability. Like, that's insane. Yeah, I'm with you. Like, if it had a negative, if the Brainstorm was a negative, like, you had to take away a counter or something like that... Totally fine with it. It would be, like, not... It would be great still, don't get me wrong, but it would not be anywhere near as good, I don't think. Um, Giralf's Messenger... Which is an interesting choice. I mean, I like that card, but messenger. I'm not. Is that it's the like big the three zombie? cost zombie. It's really specific. Oh, it's very three good. Black. Yeah. Uh, um. While you're looking that up, paradox engine came up twice. Uh, which paradox engine is really sweet. Uh, lightning bolt. Duh. Somebody said no. I don't think lightning bolt's pushed. Um, it's great, but it's not a push card. And then monastery oh, no, yeah. mentor. Yeah, girl's messenger definitely. I'm yeah, it's that. a sweet card. Um, Monastery Mentor is the last one, which is really good, <laughs> I will say. Yeah. Um, but uh, really only in older formats. It's it's kind of, I, I don't want to say bad, but it's not really good in, like, modern or anything like that, where it's interestingly legal. Right. I don't think it's good in modern. I think you're right. No. It just doesn't have the meta for it. 
Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't have the backup Excuse free me. spells that you get right. in old school formats. Right. This kit is not as vast. Exactly. Um, so the question for this week is, do you support proxying and why? Specifically in what capacity? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Um, but do you support it? Why? And, you know, just kind of generally speaking about proxying mm -hmm. and how you feel about it. Yeah. We want to know your feelings. This is a safe place you can share. Um, okay, sure. so... <laughs> We, of course, have our uh, crack pack sponsored by Grand Slam Comics and Collectibles, as well as our goal cards. Mine is Supreme Phantom. Leonin War Leader, yes. my friends. Are we doing the... Uh, yeah, I think it's the coolest way to do it. All right. Ready? Yeah, yeah. Three, two, one. Oh, I got a foil. <laughs> 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 I didn't get it. I got Desecrated too. And I got Spit Flame. Spit Flame deals four damage to target creature. Whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay one red. If you do, return Spit mm. Flame from your graveyard to your hand. I love that. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's, it's pretty great cool. removal. Uh, Desecrated Tomb is an artifact for three. Whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, create a 1-1 one -one flying bat. Uh, onto, put it onto the battlefield. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> shield mirror. Yeah, it's um, for you, bud. I think, honestly, I'd pick the foil electricity. Electrify. I was saying electricery, but I knew I that know. wasn't correct. Um, yeah. I also have a dra uh, Draconic Disciple, which is a very good card, Ooh. but it's a little bit pigeonholy right off the bat. I think Electrify is just good in any red deck. So sure. I think I'd stick with the Electrify. Definitely not the rare. <laughs> um, that card's really good. Yeah, I think... Shield Mirror. <laughs> know my pick is it might be it might be havoc devils four three trample feels kind of bad it does but i don't have why, like, why not spitfire spitfire is good spitfire yeah you're rare oh i forgot about spitfire i already forgot about my rare spit flame spit flame sorry spitfire. no it's spit flame. yeah it's definitely spit flame. I think about that and then you yes. get second pick, pick uh the disciple and then you've got dragon dragon uh yeah no i'm energy going on no i'm all in spit yeah. flame spit i can't believe great. i forgot about that um um, I yeah. have a I have a hot take. If you want one, are you ready for one? It might be a little lengthy. Okay. What you think? I since mean, we're, since we're talking about limited, yeah, go for it. So a discussion happened on Facebook. So Star City Games every it's a now scary and thought. then. What? Nothing. Go ahead. <laughs> every now and then, Star City will put out a just like a picture of a pack, basically. You know, all your cards and say what's your first pick. Yeah. Um, so Banefire was the rare. Okay. Uh, most of the rest of the pack doesn't matter, uh, but Plague Mare was also in the pack. Mm. About 70 people chimed in or so said Banefire is like clearly the best. Mm -hmm. And I said Plague Mirror is the best. And then I got crucified. Yeah, you probably should have. Here's my my hot take. I think Banefire is a trap for limited. No, it's not. Here's my, here's my points. Here's what it's, I'm going to bring up. All right. So at what point are you going to use Banefire? You can use it at any point and it's fine. You can use Banefire at any point and it's fine. You can use it against creatures. Yeah, and then it's just a removal spell and it's gone. Yeah, but it's a As removal a spell that, scare, that scales or it's a finisher, so it's always going to be good. It is not always going to be good. Um, Tell me when it's not. Early game. Like, you just use it to kill... Well, you would... I mean, you hold on to it, I guess, if you need to, but like... Right, it so now it's a dead draw. If you want your maximum, like... Your maximum power of bane fire. But it's never actually dead because it's always playable. It's never 100% dead. Like, yeah, you can... It would suck to have to use it on a 1-1. One -one. I get that. Right. Or, like, some early... I understand where you're coming right. from. But that it still is something to kill that. Like, it's not ever actually dead. Here's why Plague Mirror's better. I don't think Plague Mirror's better. I think It's so. a great card. Don't get me wrong. Because, okay. I'm talking, like, for pick one. I'd definitely pick Banefire. You think? Yeah, 100%. Man. I would never There's first pick no removal doubt. if I had a card that affected the board. I would definitely pick Banefire. Plague Mare's a 2-2 two, two body. Yep. Which is fine. For three. For three. One and two black. Right. Can't be blocked by white creatures, so it's got protection. Incidental upside. Right. Mm -hmm. Pro I say protection. It's got evasion. Yeah. I say incidental evasion. But it shrinks a board. It does. So it's already removal on its own. It is. In certain instances. And it's not spot removal. It can remove two. Absolutely. I Any think more there's than one, it's already better than main fire if it removes two things. But it doesn't actually, like, yes and no, because yes, it affects the board. Mm -hmm. The ceiling for that is definitely higher. But Banefire can actually just win you the game. 
potentially like on the spot. Potentially, but would you not this rather can potentially kill a bunch of one ones? But it doesn't actually like if the opponent well, no, doesn't it does have kill, any. It does kill one ones if the opponent has them. Right, right, right. <laughs> like that's what I'm but, saying. But, so but, like, but, but, but it's potentially if yeah. you, if ba- if fire <laughs> is your bomb. Well, you wouldn't want that as your only bomb. Well, okay. That's what I'm I saying. I mean, it's like, yeah, you wouldn't, you want to be, you do not want to be 100% dependent on one bomb, but that goes for every limited deck. Like, I would yeah. never want to be 100% dependent on only one card to win the game. Sure, sure, sure. But Banefire gives you an out to win the game. It gives you removal to deal with any type of creature, There's... and it scales throughout the entire game. Yeah, I think you changed my mind, actually. I mean... <laughs> I think you did. I like Plague Mare. Don't get me wrong. I would first pick that, but not with not Banefire. Over Banefire? Fire. Not with Banefire. I still Banefire. think I'd pick it over Banefire. Well, I would Banefire it once it comes into play. <laughs> well, that's fine. I just lost a 2-2 to Banefire. It's fine. Because here's the thing. I don't think you ever really use Banefire as removal unless you're losing. And at that point, you can't win the game with Banefire. So it doesn't help you as a bomb. No, but it does get you out of a very terrible situation. Put it in quadrant theory. Is it useful in the beginning of the game? I'd say no. I think Cause in I've terms of does first... it have a use, yes, because you can kill creatures with it. But then so does Blazing Hope. If it you, does. You can kill creatures with yes. Blazing Hope. But it's not. that's much more conditional, but yeah, sure. sure. But no, I think it's very bad early game. It's not good early game. I'm not saying it is, but it's okay. not dead early game either. It's but y- if you use it, you don't get it late game. Right, but I'm just saying if you had to play it in the early game for whatever <sighs> reason, it's not dead. Like you can use it, and can. it can okay. be very useful. Okay, mid game or what board stall is, or winning losing and then board yeah. stall. Uh, or I mean, late game. Winning, it just kind of... Winning, it just, just solidifies the game. Sure. Losing, it can deal with the creature that you're losing to, or it can sure. even out life totals, whatever you need it to do. Sure. If you're... What was the last one? I just said it. What was the last quadrant? Board stall, right? Board stall. Is that right? I believe so. You can either poke through damage, or you can get rid of a creature that's causing a board stall. Mm. So it's, like, good all the time. It's not amazing early game. I get that. But it's, like... Man. It's not bad ever. Man, you got me. Yeah, you got me. Just saying. And on that note. <laughs> yeah, no. All I, right. Uh, I will concede. Yes, I lay down my hat in... in um. I won an argument for the first time. And what's the word? Ever. Concession. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I like Banefire a lot, so... <laughs> Just saying. No, yeah, it's pretty good. Really good. I think it's awesome and constructed. Like, yeah, of course. I mean, I've it's got there. You exploit the crap out of it. Four in my pet deck, but <laughs> four of in my pet deck. But yeah, man, no. Okay, yeah, that I makes think, a lot of sense. Makes a lot I of think sense. Makes a lot of I'm sense. Right on this one, <laughs> to be honest, which I don't normally just outright say, no, but yeah, I think I'm I right think, on that one. <sighs> Sorry, buddy. I don't know. I'm going with Cab's theory again, man. I just keep calling back to that. I mean, cards affect board state only, and I get that. I man. understand. I think Plague Mare is great. I would run them both in the same deck if I could, but I'm just saying, yeah, like, for sure. and there's no way it would wheel, so it's not like you'd ever get Plague Mare back, but... No, yeah, Banefire's the choice. Banefire's the choice. Sorry, buddy. Man! I gotta go tell all those people I said to Sorry. Suck it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, so we are gonna wrap up this episode. Thank you again to Andrew for guest starring on this episode. We hope yeah. to do that a little bit more. Uh, we're kind of thinking once a month. Yeah. Uh, roughly. Really. It's not like set in stone by any means, but we, we do have some the audio maybe. Too. Yeah, we need to work out some audio issues. Sorry if it was a little bad for you guys, but we'll do the best we, we can. We haven't heard it yet. Yep. Uh, but we'll do the best we can to get that sorted out and uh, excited for the next one. But yes, 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 um, yes. we are going to get out of here. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to like and comment down below. And of course, subscribe if you're interested in seeing more of our awesome content. But well, my name is our Kevin. Content. Yeah, yes. our content. My name's Kevin. My name's Will. This has been It Resolves.